Hey, it's Mark Bergen from the Browns Nation Station. The listeners of the Browns Nation Station can show their Browns Nation pride by going to brownsnationswag.com. The site has all the latest and best fan gear to represent your team. It's the off season. Again, that's brownsnationswag.com. And if you're watching the Browns Nation Station on YouTube, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button so you never miss another show. All right, cue the music. It's time to start the show. Welcome to the Browns Nation Station. I'm your host, Mark Bergen, joined tonight by fellow BrownsNation.com writers, Pat Opperman and Steven Kabitza. Fellas, it's been too long since we've last spoken. How are you doing tonight? You go ahead, Mark. I, I'm, uh, I'm always the same, so. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why we're recording tonight is free agency is right around the corner starting next month on March the 15th. The legal negotiating window opens up and players can officially sign on March the 17th. And I'm going to address the elephant in the room, fellas. J.J. Watt is a free agent, and the Browns have the cap space to get him if they can reach a deal. The Browns have somewhere between 20 to $28 million, depending on which source you go with. But like how last offseason, the Browns' biggest need was upgrading the offensive line. I would say that this upcoming offseason, the biggest need is upgrading the defensive front seven. And I think that starts up front, finding someone to pair with Miles Garrett. What say you, Pat? Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct that that the uh, priority is going to be an opposite end. I think that a lot of teams prove if you have that second guy uh, makes all the difference in the world as far as getting that pass rush, which is you know something we need. Um, and I think that J.J. Watt is probably going to be the guy. I think he fits a couple of things. Uh, there's some knocks. People are complaining that, you know, why would you sign a 32 year old you know, football player who has been hurt a lot? And um and I think it's kind of a bum rap. You have uh, the guys played a full season, two out of the last three years. Um, you know, then they say, well, he only had five sacks. He's obviously failing. He was the only guy on the defensive line in Houston. He drew more double teams than any other defensive lineman in the league last year, despite being 32 years old. And the thought of having him play an opposite Miles Garrett, I mean, who are you going to double team? If you double team Watt, you got Garrett running in. You double team Garrett, I think Watt that'll make him two or three years younger, you know, without that double team on him. And if you try to double team them both, then you've got everybody else running around and covering, you know, downfield and it's not a bad thing. So you're, you're wreaking havoc on the offense and, um, you know, making them do things that they might not want to do by having that bookend in there. And I think Watt, you know, he's going to have a couple of more years. And by then, uh, you know, the, the, Andrew, you know, the Andrew Barry or somebody will have somebody ready to step in. And um, I think that's, uh, that's okay. And the most important part of this whole thing is that you get a player of that quality and you probably get them at a decent price. It's not going to be a long-term contract. It's going to be two years, maybe, maybe, you know, third option. And uh, the price I think per year will be less. Uh, I think you can get him at 10 mil, maybe with some in incentives. And um, as opposed to going full bore on one of the younger guys at 20 mil a year or 16 mil a year that they're looking for. So, uh, so I think, you know, you got a guy who still has something left in the tank, a guy who wants to be here to play against his brothers twice a year. And, um, and a guy that comes in under our budget. So I think he becomes a Brown. Yeah, I'm going to have to totally agree with that. I, I know, you know, in preparation for this show, there's a lot of options um, to look at, you know, on the defensive end spot. But I see zero negatives um, of the Browns signing J.J. Watt. I think this year with the lower salary cap, teams are, are going to land a lot of one-year deals. Um, they're going to be able to underpay, but, you know, pay in line with what the salary cap is. Watt was on a horrific Houston Texans team. The, I think looking at stat numbers, kind of like how you pointed out, Pat, is you have to look into it more than just the number of sacks because, you know, if the team's getting killed or if, you know, he's getting double teamed, it doesn't tell the whole story at all. I mean, he played all 16 games last year so. You know, you say, oh, well, he got this, you know, this injury three years ago. Okay, well, as long as it's healed, um, you know, there's no issues there. You know, kind of the, the idea of someone being injury prone is a little overused, I think, in sports, unless there is a chronic problem. But yeah, I don't think it's a hot take to say there's zero negatives. And I think even, I mean, I'm biased as a Browns fan, you know, on a Browns podcast. But um, I think even objectively reading around 
the league and what different analysts are saying. The Browns are the best fit for Watt. They're one of the only teams that could pay him too. So it's easy, I think, to get caught up in social media and seeing arguments about why or why they shouldn't. But to me right now, it seems like almost a lock that he's going to come here because the fun scenario of him going to Pittsburgh, it's just not financially possible because they're going to bring Ben Roethlisberger back. And that's, I think, going to tank that team. But that's a whole other topic. To piggyback off that, and let me push back a little bit. I wouldn't say there's zero downside in signing Watt. Whichever team signs him, the really the ultimate indication of whether it will be a successful signing is if he can stay healthy. The best ability is availability. So he plays in 16 games last season during 2020, but he only played in eight in the 29th season, played in all 16 in 2018, but was limited to five games in 2017 and three games in 2016. And so if he can move past that, prove that he can stay on the field from a free agency standpoint, signing and saying, okay, you're going to have to double team Miles Garrett, and I'm going to get to have single teams my entire time in Cleveland. If you're an opposing offense, and if you're a quarterback, especially in the AFC North in this division, you pair both Watt and Garrett together. That would be an absolutely scary duo. It would be a race to the quarterback. It would be awesome to watch. Absolutely. I think uh, also, you know, the other factor here, too, is just the emotional lift. Um, you know, besides the fact that he only has a single team, the fact that he's playing on a playoff bound team, probably, you know, with the great attitude of Cleveland coming out of Houston, as far as the management uh, goes and everything. Um, I just think emotionally that comment he made to Deshaun Watson at the end of the season, when he walked out the field and apologized for wasting a year on Deshaun Watson, I think indicates also that he, he realized he wasted a year of his own career. And I think he knows it's coming to an end and, uh, that motivation factor and the fact he's on a playoff level team now, now I think will also just emotionally recharge him and, and make him even better than we think. I think Steven brings up a great point too about the Texans defense and their struggles defensively. They allowed the most rushing yards in the league last season, 160 yards per game. So Pat, you had mentioned about how teams would double team Watt. He didn't have anyone else around him. And he didn't have a guy like a Jadavion Clowney who he had paired with earlier in his career in previous seasons when he had had a high statistical output when he was playing at a level when he was the defensive player of the year. He didn't have that this past season in Houston from a defensive standpoint. He also didn't have an Andrew Billings and a um, Sheldon Richardson. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's not just the two ends of the guys in the middle too. Um, and he's just, he's just the whole team around him and just the defensive philosophy of Joe Woods. I just, everything was so negative in Houston last year. I just think that, um, you know, that, yeah, of course they, they, the teams ran a lot against them because they were always in the lead. They were always, you know, just beating up on the Texans for the most part. And uh, even with Sean Watson bringing them back uh, when he could, um, it's just a different ball game, different world. It's just, that's just, there's a, it's a no brainer to me to bring the guy here. I don't care that he's 32. I want to be the first guy to have a second wind at that age, at that position. So. The good news for the Browns is if they don't wind up with J.J. Watt, there are several other edge rushers that they could get who might even be better at this point in their careers because, again, J.J. Watt will be 32 as of next month, as of the month of March. So who am I talking about here? Shaq Barrett is a free agent, and he helped the Buccaneers win a Super Bowl this past season, a guy who led the NFL in sacks during the 2019 season. Bud Dupree, he's coming off an an ACL injury, but if, say, the Browns got Bud Dupree off the edge, not only are you bringing in a very good pass rusher off the edge, you're also stealing him away from a division rival in the Pittsburgh Steelers. Von Miller's out there, Jadavion Clowney, Yannick Ngankwe. Is there another guy outside of Watt that you guys like for the Browns to sign? Say they're not able to get Watt. Say Watt goes to Green Bay where he owns a home in the state of Wisconsin. Is there someone else that you like as a fit for the Browns for, as, a, as an edge rusher in this year's free agency? I think the list you mentioned is, I mean, and one point I wanted to make too, considering the list you mentioned, is that if Watt is openly talking about potentially joining the Browns, then the Browns can sign anyone. So there's the, it's weird to talk about uh, as a Browns fan, but they're in the position where They are a legitimate Super Bowl contender and there's going to be no limits to what they can do. 
They have a ton of cap space, which is going to be going away once the Baker, Mayfield, and Denzel Ward deals, you know, become official in the next year or two. So they're looking around the league. Guys are going to want to sign one-year deals this year because they have to wait to get their max money, you know, likely till 2022. Um, I mean, Bud Dupree, Jadavian Clowney stand out as top options. Shaq Barrett is going to be, I think, trickier because he's probably going to want to run it back in Tampa Bay. So you look at that, how dominant that defense was. Why would he say, I want a new challenge? It's not like um, he doesn't seem like a, you know, maybe like a LeBron type player who's I won here. I want to go win here. It's like this, we have a good thing going. The only um, kind of option I don't like is Von Miller, which, you know, from a talent perspective, he's, elite you know one of the most elite ends in the league but he has had health issues he has some off the field issues which uh could end up being serious so you don't really want to bring that into this locker room it's a total total polar opposite of what Watt would bring in terms of like the leadership the personality um so when you're looking at this list you can really say all right the whole free agent list for the whole offseason you could say anyone any available end we can target but I keep going back to Watt. Um, you know, Clowney would be a fine consolation, but does he want to play in Cleveland after, you know, kind of the way he handled last off season? Do they still want him after the way he handled that? So I keep going back to Watt. Shaq Barrett would be kind of the fantasy option. Um, but, you know, I'm curious, Pat, what you think, um, you know, about the list. One, the one name you guys uh, didn't mention um, – from inside the division, but from the other direction, is Carl Lawson from the Bengals. Uh, again, since uh, Cleveland, we don't have an infinite amount of free agent, you know, money to spend. But uh, but I could see Lawson being the kind of guy, you know, this year's Austin Hooper, uh, throw out a fast offer, a really high offer, maybe overpaid by a million or two for the first couple of years, and steal him away before Cincinnati knows what's happening. Uh, they're going to do everything they can to hold on to him, but they're a little. Um, they got a few challenges. They got quite a few free agents too, and their priorities are offensive line to uh, keep their quarterback from going down again. So my, my dream play would be Carl Lawson coming here on a four or five year contract, even, and uh, being there with Miles. Uh, but monetarily, he probably won't be able to do it. I think uh, the guy I would give the edge to it. They don't get why the type of player that um, that Barry would go after. I think you know again trying to fit into the budget. Uh, there is a guy out there who uh, you already mentioned, but he's, he just seems to be a better second and edge player than a first and a primary guy. He proved that he can't be the man, but I think if you put Yannick uh, and, and Goulet, whatever his name is, uh, if you put him opposite Miles Gary, uh, he will thrive. Uh, the problem with that is you don't want to pay him top dollar if he's going to be the second best guy. So if his price comes down, and, and it might, it might come down to about that 10 or $12 million range, of, probably closer to twelve. Uh, he might be worth the stab if he can't get um, JJ. I want to go on the record to say, sign me up for Opperman's 11 in the stealth mission in signing away Carl Lawson to the Cleveland Browns. I want to be a part of that crew. I, I, I see what you're doing there. And it's addition by subtraction, subtraction from an AFC North opponent in the Bengals. So sign me up for that. You know, you one go. option too. Um, which we didn't mention because it's internal, but you know, Olivier Vernon might have his value totally slashed this off season because of injuries, because of problems. So I think he's someone to keep in mind too. If Watt goes to green Bay and Gakwe says, I want a max deal. I don't care, which kind of seems like his trajectory at this point, you know, we're, we're able to hype up all the potential options because the Browns have finally come to a point where we can talk like this. But it's very possible that they can get a, uh, you know, like a non, what's well, not fu a fully non guaranteed deal for Vernon, um, something similar to what his structure was going to be last year before he restructured his contract. So it's, I think it's something to keep in mind. I think a lot of Browns fans have already written him off, have said, oh, it's, you know, it's JJ Watt, it's Clowney, it's whatever. But I think keeping him in mind, and if they do end up signing him, it shouldn't be seen as this like really negative, you know, consolation. It would have to be for the right number, but I still think you would have to make some sort of major addition to the front seven, given the front seven's problems last season. 
And that, in my opinion, needs to be the number one priority for the Browns this offseason. So I, I, if you bring back Vernon, who else are you bringing in to address some of the problems that this defense had? It was a, it was a bend but don't break defense. Yeah, it's – I mean, that's the million-dollar question, right? Who are you going to bring in? Um, you look to the draft as well, not to try to dive into draft prospects. We are a, in a free agency conversation right now, but – you, you just don't know with the Browns, too, how they value each position, you know, with Andrew Barry's um, kind of philosophy in the front office. I think we can rattle down the list of all these available options, but they might just like who they've had. I don't, I don't want to sound too negative, you know, with the Browns, you know, hype train kind of going this offseason, but I'm not so sure they would spend big on, you know, really big, like multi-year deal on someone who's not J.J. Watt. I mean, I could be totally off, but that's just how I see the situation. Well, that's why I think Barrett's going to break the bank because he's 28 years old, coming off a really great Super Bowl. So you look at the stats, you see only one sack. We had eight quarterback pressures, and he was one of the key reasons why the Buccaneers' defense held the Chiefs in the Super Bowl without a touchdown. Now, you can credit Devin White as well. You can credit Antoine Winfield. We don't need to relitigate the Super Bowl. But this is a guy who's proven that he can do what he does at a high level with that Buccaneers front four. And he was a key, key part of that. He's going to make top dollar. And if the Bucs don't bring him back again on a franchise tag, which would be near $20 million, I would imagine he'll seek out that multi-year deal. Now, whether the Browns would want to fork, fork over that money, Stephen, you brought this up. You know, you're going to have the fifth year options of Denzel Ward and Baker Mayfield. And then you're probably going to want to sign both of those players long term as well. So all of that factors into the decision of who you bring in on the edge. I certainly hope that it's Watt. I think Watt's the white whale of this free agent class. I think he'd probably be the best fit if he can stay healthy. And I think that's really going to be the key for him. You know, you can point to some other things with each of the other players, whether it's money, whether it's health, whether it's, uh, you know, fit, whether it's things that they have going on off the field. But I, I think the list from an edge, uh, an edge rush standpoint starts with Watt and Barrett in some order. And if the Browns could bring in either of those guys, it'd be a major upgrade to their defense. And one thing to keep in mind, too, don't forget Nick Chubb's going to need a new contract, too. Yeah. So we're talking, you yeah. know, Barrett's, Barrett's probably going to want to maximize his value unless he says, I'll do the one-year deal thing because of the changed salary cap. So the Browns have three Pro Bowl players that have to give extensions soon. So it's, it's going to be really tricky. And that's why I think Watt stands out as that top option because he might just take that year to try to win a Super Bowl. Then maybe he goes to Pittsburgh you know, next year, the year after, something like that to play with his brother. We'll see what happens there. Let's go to the linebacker position. And Steven, I think it was your notes where you had some linebackers in this free agent class that you that you liked and you thought would be a good fit in Cleveland. The flo- I'm going to give the floor over to you. Who do you like for the Browns to sign at the linebacker position to make an upgrade there? Yeah, the, the one note that we all have, which – um, I appreciate the credit. I did not put him in there, <laughs> but oh, Pat, that was you, but I will say based oh, on man. <laughs> Pat's notes, the, the one thing that really we have to keep an eye on is are the Browns going to want to re-sign Malcolm Smith? You know, every single Browns game, they say, you know, former Super Bowl MVP and we go, okay, that was a long time ago. What is he doing for us now? Are, you know, are all our young defenders going to be healthy next year? Are the Browns going to keep doing the narrative, which this is a different position, but for example, oh, well, we're only bad this year because Grant Delpit's hurt. Okay, well, this is someone who's never played a game. We have all these young SEC defenders, uh, you know, out in the linebacker and safety positions um, and with Greedy Williams at corner too. So you look at Smith and you go, well, he has the reputation. He has the analytics that stand out, but is he worth a multi-year deal? And I don't know. That's the one player to me that stands out as a very interesting, um, you know, storyline to follow this offseason, how he's valued. But Pat, I'll toss it to you because you had the great notes in there. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm for signing uh, Malcolm Smith back, okay? And uh, there are, you know, again, this isn't a draft thing. There's one or two linebackers that, that are pretty high rated that, probably will be off the board when Cleveland picks, but might not be. 
And that'll make the big difference. If they get one of them, Malcolm Smith on two years makes a lot of sense. You know, let them develop and get going. But Malcolm Smith, you know, you're saying he was, he was the ex-MVP. He was the number seven rated um, linebacker against the pass last year in the whole league. And uh, he had the second most snaps of everybody behind Goodson at the position. So he has value. And um, I don't think he's going to cost a lot. I don't think he's going to break the bank. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about B.J. Goodson, leader, leading tackler, um, you know, uh, hard worker and all that. But, um, but our, you know, how many times do we see that first down, you know, that, that third down pass for a first down in front of the linebackers uh, with, you know, B.J. Goodson or, or Sayon uh, Takitaki, you know, a step behind, you know. And uh, we have one guy who maybe can cover from the linebacker position, uh, and that was um, Smith. So if you can't get an upgrade, that's the guy you want. We're not getting Matt Milano. Okay, Buffalo's not going to let him pass. I see a lot of Browns fans, you know, we want Matt Milano, we want Matt Milano. It's just not happening. Uh, if they have to, Buffalo will franchise tag him uh, while they negotiate a longer deal. But, um, but he's not coming. Uh, there is one guy, uh, speaking of Tampa Bay, um, uh, Jayon Brown. He's uh, played out his rookie contract. Uh, he missed most of last season or part of last season, end of the year on injury reserve with an elbow fracture. And uh, so he's hurt. And uh, if you watch the end of the Super Bowl with uh, Bruce Arians walking around telling uh, Barrett and, you know, all those other free agents, you're not going anywhere, you're not going anywhere, you're not going anywhere. They can't sign all those guys. And I think this guy coming off an elbow injury, he rated pretty high for four years, uh, especially in coverage at the linebacker spot. He may be able to be inexpensive enough and a good enough quality to add out of Tampa Bay, um, Jayon Brown. Other than that, the other big thing I'm going to tell you is that just remind you that Joe Woods uh, defense uh, really minimizes the importance of the linebacker. So I don't see them spending any, anything big on anybody. And, and uh, it may be the last position they worry about uh, because they like the three guys they have on the roster now. And uh, I think that if he settles his safety and cornerback holes, you're going to see a lot of two linebacker sets. You're going to see a lot of uh, dime and, you know, uh, big defensive backfield sets from Joe Woods, which is what was the plan last year before everybody got hurt. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't want to spend a lot of, you know, I don't think there's going to be a lot of research or a lot of uh, chasing a big name guy on there, but, um, but I think if we can get back somebody at a reasonable price, uh, he'll, he'll bring back somebody he already knows. We've got to move to the defensive backs and, I guess this is the portion of the program where we bring up Richard Sherman and I've seen some chatter back and forth on Twitter and, you know, thanks CJ McCollum, the Blazers guard who is a huge Browns fan. He's been trying to advocate for the Browns to make some big free agent signings up on BrownsNation.com though. I actually wrote about all the reasons why the Browns should not sign Richard Sherman. It's not to take away from what he's accomplished as a five-time pro bowler, but the fact of the matter is he's going to be 33 next season. He hasn't played a full 16 game season since 2016. He's missed injuries. He was only played in five games last season. And everyone always wants to mention how Sherman is a zone corner. Let me break this down even more simply for you. If you watch a 49ers game that he played in or a Seahawks game that he played in, he only plays on the left side of the field. He rarely, if ever, matches up across the field from the other receivers, the other team's best receiver, the number one receiver. He plays on one side of the field. Now that will serve him well as his athleticism fades towards the twilight of his career. But with the combination of that and injuries, and then Ward would be then stuck on the right side and not even to mention what he could do to a locker room instead, you know, he's proven he's a winner, but at the same time, he's got a lot of personality I just don't think he would be a good fit for the Browns. He's a player. I think the Browns should pass on on free agency and let someone else sign him. But that's just my two cents worth on Richard Sherman. Yeah. I actually wrote uh, a month ago, kind of contradicted you, but this was before the Watt rumors were real because he wasn't let go yet. I thought the Browns should look into it, but that would be without considering JJ Watt and the fact that they need to add a top defensive lineman. Sherman, I mean, what the Browns need, um, you know, start thinking like a championship team. They need someone who can help slow down Tyreek Hill. I mean, that's going to be one of the top options or someone who can help the Browns shut down Lamar Jackson or Hollywood Brown. So they have to think 
you know, while Sherman is that big name and on Twitter, fans are always going to go after the big names from an era, you know, it's okay. Well, I know Richard Sherman, he's a star. Let's sign him. Well, what about, you know, some 24, 25 year old guys who might be lower level free agents, but are faster, better in coverage and everything. So I'm totally on board now with not signing Sherman. I think like you said, he's got a huge personality, but we don't know the extent of that, like in a locker room, but it's not like JJ Watt, who seems like he just wants to come in. He would defer to Miles Garrett or just, you know, lead and be quiet in that way. Sherman would kind of be the face of the defense almost like in the secondary. He's, he'd be with a coach he's played with before. It's just too much going on. But at the same time, I don't think they should ignore the position because I don't know if I have faith that Greedy Williams is going to play. Like so, ever. He's got uh, the what's it, small tissue injuries and he's got apparently some nerve damage. It sounds so, like you have more faith that Grant Delpit can come back healthy and contribute to the secondary compared to Greedy Williams. So I, I, both of those oh, yeah. players do back for the Browns in the 2021 season. So again, that kind of builds to my point on where I just don't think, I think Sherman yeah. has some gas left in the tank. I just am not sure he's the right fit for the Browns. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the, you can go ahead, Pat. I'm just going to repeat myself that, you know, I, um, I do think Delpit's coming back because his injury was not a nerve related injury, but no faith in Greedy coming back. Yeah, I think Sherman is a luxury that, um, you know, would be great. I, I, I would think he would be okay on the Browns. I think you need that personality. Okay, you know, you're worried about the locker room, but you need a big mouth on the field. Miles Garrett leads by example, Denzel Ward leads by example. You know, that's great, but you need somebody who's going to get in the face of a referee once in a while, start a fight, you know, really, you know, get the team riled up. And um, I think that's what he brings. Plus his familiarity with Joe Woods, he'd be a great mentor to, to, uh, to Greedy if he comes back, to whoever we draft this year to replace him if he doesn't come back, uh, all these guys. But, you know, he didn't lose, to, he doesn't seem to lose too much. We look at stats, okay? And last year, hardly anybody threw in his direction. He didn't, you know, they were constantly throwing away from him. And uh, despite that, he gave us some pretty big plays, you know, some high, you know, really bad timed, uh, you know, pass uh, completions. But, um, but for the most part, his numbers were good because they weren't throwing at him. But what happens next year when he's lined up opposite the top ranked cover corner in the league and Denzel Ward? Well, now we're throwing at him because we're not going to throw at Ward. So does he get exposed as a 33 year old cornerback who's lost a step? in his one season with, with Cleveland. I think that's too big a risk at that price. And with the cap restrictions we do have, um, I, I think that that's just something that you disregard. And to piggyback off that, I think that the secondary's play is going to improve once you improve the front forward, where if you can get to the quarterback with four guys, how much easier of a job that makes it for the guys on the back end of the defense? Sure, especially if they're double teaming uh, each end. You know, that's six guys in plus the quarterback. That's seven at least. So you go going, you know, seven on four in the defensive backfield. That's, uh, that's a pretty good setup. <laughs> Let me throw out some names. And if you guys, if any of them stick out to you, just shout. I'll, I'll list some names and then turn things over to you guys. So I've seen the Browns link to safety Anthony Harris. He played for the Vikings. That's what pro football focus predicts will happen, that the Browns will sign him. Marcus Williams, another free agent safety uh, Xavier Woods, cornerback Troy Hill, uh, the Jets' Brian Poole, Mike Hilton, the nickelback from the Pittsburgh Steelers. That would be nice to see, again, stealing a player that played in your division. Uh, Patrick Peterson as well, another veteran, all-pro cornerback. Uh, any, any of those names stick out to either of you? I would say Xavier Woods to me because, you know, we are relying on Grant Delpit coming back, so maybe they don't put you know all their attention on going after someone like Patrick Peterson who may not want to come to Cleveland I mean if we're really talking about we're looking at a one or two year deal for these guys um is someone like him going to want to come to Cleveland after you know being out west for so long um Xavier Woods though the Cowboys have to make a lot of changes um they're 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 paying Dak Prescott they're paying Amari Cooper and Ezekiel Elliott um they're just, they're in a bad situation um, financially. So I like him as someone who's kind of under the radar with Delpit coming back, who, 
who could stink. I mean, I'll put that out there. We have no idea. He didn't play at all last year. He was hurt the whole year, you know, from camp. So we're going off his draft hype. But out of that list, I don't, I don't see Mike Hilton coming to Cleveland. There's still that weird dynamic of a Brown Steelers. Like, I know it wouldn't be a trade, but like a player exchange. Really, Joe Hayden going to Pittsburgh was kind of a situation where he was still good and the Browns just cut him because it was 2016 and that was a strategy that year. <laughs> so they're like, okay, we're, right, we're two hours down the road. Just come to us. So I think that was kind of an anomaly. I'm not sure if Hilton would come here. Yeah, sorry to bring up 2016. That's They cut him and he was fine and it made no sense and I'm still upset about it. Um, but yeah, from, from your list, Anthony Harris is linked to the Browns because of Stefanski and, you know, uh, you know, the Vikings connection. I'm not so sure about him really being a huge game changer. He's probably going to cost too much for the Browns if our main focus is the defensive line in this discussion. So I'll stick with Woods and toss it to you, Pat. Well, I think if they get, if they get JJ Watt at the price that um, I think they can get him at, it would not surprise me if they signed two safeties and, um, I think they'll go after a big guy, a big name guy or somebody with skills like a Marcus Williams, who, um, you know, New Orleans probably won't be able to re-sign him. Um, uh, there's a couple of guys out there. This Keanu Neal, who uh, had two years missed with injury, came back pretty good last year. It doesn't look like Atlanta's interested in bringing him back. Um, but the guy I, I'm confident they're going to go after is the same guy that you said, uh, which is Xavier Woods. I think that uh, Jimmy Jones did us a great service by uh, yelling at Woods all year long and calling him every name in the book and blaming him for all of Dallas's defensive trouble. <laughs> and I think he's a going to drive the price down, and b he's going to drive him behind all those other guys we listed at the safety position. I think a lot of teams are going to try to take advantage of um, salary cap, uh, free, you know, victim free agents that are coming out there, and. Um, I think we're going to be able to make a reasonable offer to Woods. I mean, not cheap, but, you know, reasonable offer to Woods and uh, be surprised at the skill we get back in return. So to me, that's a, a quality, um, you know, value signing um, at safety. And it doesn't rule out signing another big guy if they can get him. Pat, you mentioned the struggles of the Cowboys and just really the entire NFC East division. If we wrangle eight more people together, we've got three of us here on tonight's Browns Nation Station – Opperman's 11 will make a run for the NFC East division with how bad it is. Uh, sign me up for that too. Sign me up for that too. And one thing with Woods really quick is that, um, you know, you land him. It's not too expensive of a deal. Mm -hmm. Then maybe you do look at someone like Anthony Harris and be like, do you want to come here for one year and try to win a Super Bowl? Because you think of the change we got, the Browns got Andrew Sandejo last year. So this year they can make the switch of a good Viking safety who can come in and actually help. So, I mean, if they're stacking up talent and it's going to look like a one-year super team, it's going to make it a lot easier to, you know, convince guys to be like, Hey, come for a year next year, you get your big money. It's almost like when basketball players are like, Oh, the contracts are going to jump up 20% next year. I'll sign a two-year deal now with an opt out. It happened with Tom Brady and the Buccaneers this season, Stephen. That, that's a great point. That's a great point. I forgot to mention one other guy, too, that was high on my list because he's listed at the bottom. But Troy Hill out of the Rams. That's another guy who the team wants to bring him back, but there's a good chance they won't. Uh, they won't be able to financially. And um, he fits the Joe Woods mold of, of being flexible. He can play inside. He can play outside. PFF slotted him as the, you know, among the top third in the slot and outside as a cornerback. And um, that to Joe Woods, I mean, he loves disguising his defense is running guys around back there. Uh, that fits right in. Um, and he'll get, a, he'll get a pretty good buck. Um, but, uh, but that's somebody who definitely fits the mold of a Joe Woods defense and would be very valuable to, uh, to Cleveland. We moved to the offensive side of the football. And Pat, we were talking some before the pod. What happens with... Richard Hollywood Higgins at the receiver position. That's really the big question the Browns have from an offensive standpoint. Yeah. I, you know, I know everybody wants Rashad Higgins back. Okay. And um, you know, so do I, you know, it was great. How many times he just found himself just standing all by him, you know, all alone in the end zone there. And um, he actually came up with, believe it or not, the third highest DVOA among all wide receivers in the league last year. 
Okay, third highest. Okay, now of course I was helped out by not only did he catch 75% of his passes, but it seems like every time Mayfield looked for him, he was either in the end zone or he was downfield for a first down. And that, of course, drives the DVA, the DVA way up. Um, as a result, he's expected to get about $6 million a year, at least, which in a year with a lot of draft picks and a year with you know a really good wide receiver class supposedly coming out and an awful lot of wide receiver free agents, um, I don't know if he's going to get that from us because that would – be on top of 30 million we're paying to OBJ and to um, Jarvis Landry. Uh, that's already just those two guys is 14% of the entire salary cap. You throw 6 million at Higgins and uh, you still don't have that really fast deep threat that they, you know, we saw it against Kansas city. Nobody could get past the secondary and get open. So uh, everybody wants us to sign like a John Ross or um, you know, Davis, Corey Davis, you know, to get past the, um, the defenders and Rashard Higgins, I mean, we can only pay so much for the wide receiver position in our one first offense. So I, I think what's working in our favor is Higgins wants to come back. I think he loves Cleveland. He loves Mayfield. His DBA, DBOA won't be as good with a different quarterback. I mean, he's Mayfield's favorite target and, and um, you know, the style of offense we run. You know, if he runs in a normal offense, he won't have as many first downs, probably not as many touchdowns. And, um he might come back at a discount. You know, he might come back like we can get him for like three or 4 million, maybe with incentives or something and maybe balloon it out, raise, give him a raise next year. You know, uh, maybe we can get him back in there, but paying that kind of money, I, I don't see him coming back at 6 million a year with the other needs that we have. I think he may be a casualty because of that. I'll preface by saying Higgins is my favorite player on the Browns, but I never, because he survived the 2016 uh, draft class, um, as the only receiver who stayed, but he, I've always liked him, you know, Freddie kitchens did him really wrong. Um, and then last year it was nice to see him get back. Um, but I'm not for the idea of, well, he's Baker's favorite target. Let's overpay him. I mean, if Baker cannot work with OBJ, that's a Baker problem. It's not on Odell Beckham. We know he's a good talented receiver. If Baker's forcing it to him or for whatever reason, the coach has got to figure that out. Because like you said, Pat, they're paying $30 million to two top receivers in Landry and OBJ. I mean, the only option is if they cut OBJ um, and then give, you know, Higgins half of what he was going to make or something like that. But, but yeah, they're paying too much to the receivers. They're going to have to extend Chubb. And when they do that, the running backs are going to take over as this very highly paid group with Chubb and Hunt. So I would like Higgins back on a one or two year deal, but I mean, um, uh, beyond that, six a year, there's just no way. And, you know, Baker's getting older, getting more used to the NFL. He can't, you know, they can't just say, oh, we got to keep him. That our third or fourth option is the quarterback's favorite target. That makes no logical sense. Once you pay Baker Mayfield major money as well, he's not going to have the plethora of options that he has right now. And to piggyback off your point, Stephen, With OBJ, you hope that you can get performances like how he played against the Dallas Cowboys on a more regular basis Mm -hmm. when you're paying him an average salary of $18 million a year. So yeah, it's nice to see Hollywood Higgins fill in once OBJ goes down, but that's why you bring in an OBJ to get that superstar level, that elite level talent actually come to fruition. And so it's do or die. That's actually, you have to make that work. And if not, I, I don't know what you could fetch in return for him in a trade, but that's the idea of having OBJ. Pat, you mentioned taking the top off of defense against Kansas city. Ideally that's the role OBJ would play in this offense. Yeah, but we just don't know. I mean, he's coming back from a pretty serious injury, yeah. Uh, yeah. getting older, you know, uh, if he loses a step or two, we still don't have that guy and we're paying paying for it but we're not getting it uh he's not going anywhere this year at least not before the start of the season because the salary his dead cap hit is too much um they can cut landry and save about 10 million but i don't see that happening um he's you know heart and soul of the team and and i think that would disrupt the locker room too much uh my my prediction is you bring back obj you bring back jarvis landry uh you have uh, donovan people jones in there in the mix and um and you got uh ryan switzer to play in the slot once in a while you know, even though he signed more as a, as a returner. Um, and then you get a cut, maybe a chief free agent slot guy too, like a Beasley or somebody out there or Snead or rather out there. Um, 
and, and you go with the draft and get a couple more guys and you try to find your fast guy that way. Uh, if they do sign a Ross or um, Corey Davis or something like that, then my prediction would be if you see that sign and you see all that money tied up this year, that both Odell Beckham and Jarvis Landry are former Cleveland Browns after the 2021 season. Wow. That is wow. Of 30 million. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, that's my prediction. So that's why I say the wide receiver, what they do is so interesting. If they play a really low key, go with all receivers. Uh, if they renegotiate, um, I, I don't see them renegotiating either contract because I think they would rather be able to drop them both sooner than later. I think they're both getting, you know, they're both getting up there in years. I mean, they're not young kids anymore, you know, and Jarvis, he's a tough guy. He played hurt, but he was hurt. And um, I think that, uh, I think that when Mayfield signs his contract and Chubb, I think they're going to need the 30 million that those two guys are tying up right now. And um, honestly, in their run first defense, tight ends, heavy Kareem Hunt loaded offense. You just don't need $30 million worth of wideouts you know, on the field. So uh, that's my prediction. I think this year we kind of sit tight. Um, if we, if we see a big signing, then that pretty much guarantees we're going to lose the other two next year. If we don't, we'll see what happens. Are you two as excited as I am for one more season of David Njoku on the Cleveland Browns roster? No, David, he, 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 he is a total disaster, um, you know, off the field and in the locker room. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because he, you know, had to go through all those losing seasons um, or if it's he's frustrated with quarterback play, but I just don't get it. I don't understand what's wrong. And he's getting paid a good amount of money on his, you know, with the fifth year option. So it makes no sense to me. I, I, they should just trade him, but maybe I'm just too bitter. Hey, I look forward, I look forward to writing about his cryptic Instagram posts in the future for BrownsNation.com. That's something that's exactly. happened plenty of times the last two seasons. Pat, go ahead. Here's my, my bold prediction is David Joker will be an ex-Brown before March 17th, okay? Uh, before this season starts, he'll be either dropped or he'll be traded, probably dropped, at a savings of $6 million. His fifth-year yeah. option is completely non-guaranteed, has no dead cap hit. So uh, that's $6 million they can open up on free agency, go out and sign, uh, you know, somebody like, I, I would like to see like a Richard Rogers type of guy come in. Uh, somebody great blocker has hands when you need them. Um, and maybe Carlson come back for the same reason, add a significant savings and open up some more room to get some of these other needs filled on defense. All right, guys, we are 45 minutes into this podcast. And this is what I am most excited to talk about tonight. The Browns, Need an upgrade at the kicker position and hear me out. You look at Cody Parkey, 86.4% for the 2020 season. That is great, but he did not attempt a field goal of 50 yards or longer. You're going to need that at some point during a critical game late in the season, maybe in the postseason. I still, maybe it's the double doink game. Maybe it's the regular season game four years ago when he hit the upright four times. This was a guy in the back half of the season going into week 17. He had missed three consecutive extra points. And if the season would have come down to whether Cody Parkey could make a crucial kick, I did not have faith in him as a kicker. I would like to see the Browns bring in someone else at the kicker position. I've said my piece. You know who else missed a couple of extra points last year? Justin Tucker. Yeah, true. Everybody can have a slump, okay? What impressed me the most about um, Cody Parkey and the reason why he will be on the field in preseason training camp, at least in the com probably in a competition, uh -oh. I would imagine, with a younger guy, is because after he had that series, he came back and connected on every kick in the playoffs. He shrugged it off, he got his uh, feet back under him, and he did fine. And um, I think that that earns him the right to come back and compete for the job if he doesn't sign somewhere else. I mean, he may get a contract, you know, with those stats, if you weren't watching him every week and you weren't shivering every time he stepped up to the, you know, to the tee, like we were as Browns fans, and you just see that 86%, you know, and, and, and the numbers, he looks like a kicker worth signing. So he may very well get other offers and not want to come back to Cleveland. But, uh, but I'm pretty sure Stefanski would like to see him in there and maybe bring in a young guy to uh, give him some competition and see what happens. And I think the final number, the final decision at the end of preseason will come down to salary cap impact more than anything else. If they have the room 
They go with the veteran. If they don't have enough room, they take a chance on the young guy. Pat is a Cody Parkey truther, but I'm going to (laughs) agree because I do remember in the Chiefs game, I watched with my parents and I said, if the Browns were down two, I'm like, they're not kicking. There's no way they kick. There's just no faith. But Parkey, objectively, his stats are fine. I do agree with you on that. And they are probably going to go down to that normal, you know, teams have kicker tryouts every year. You know, you don't want to complain too much, Mark, and then they draft a guy, (laughs) which the Browns have done in the past, drafting a kicker, which is the worst decision a team can possibly make. Um, And I understand that the weather is bad in Cleveland, but not even to attempt a field goal of 50 yards. That's pretty standard for an NFL kicker to be able to at least kick a field goal from 50 yards. And the Browns, if it's 50 yards or longer, they're going to put the offense back out on the field to try to convert a first down that, or they're going to punt. So it's like, I I want someone with the, with a little bit better of a leg, even if they aren't quite as accurate that that's, that's, I've said my piece. You guys know how I feel about Cody Parkey. We, was, that, was that a result of lack of faith in a kicker or a result of the gunslinging mentality of Kevin Stefanski? You got, yeah. Nick, Hunt, you got Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt back there. You got, you know, a tight ends heavy, you know, made for short yardage passes. Um, you know, I, I don't know that that was definitely a negative on Parkey as much as it was our philosophy. I don't remember – maybe one or two times where I thought maybe they'll try the field goal and they didn't. For the most part, it was very little. I was not surprised by, you know, going for it on fourth down or punting for the most part during the season. I don't remember any real major instances. Do you? Pat, that's a good point and that's fair, but I just want to say, I don't want to say look back on this conversation when it's next, say January and we're wondering what happened and I'll say, Hey, I told you so. That's a fair point though, in terms of, going forward on fourth down in a short yarded situation, especially when you can hand the ball to either Nick Chubb or Kareem Hunt. That's, that's fair. That's fair. I never want to see a 50 yard field goal. Personally, I'm fully of the mindset. Go for it. I hate watching kickers kick. And as long as the Browns don't punt from inside, you know, that area, you know, once you're to the 33, 35 yard line, I'm fine with going for it every time. Um, but I, I, I agree that Parky will likely be back, but at the same time, I agree with Mark that, you know, every time he kicks, I'm like, he's, he's going to miss it. I'm, I'm assured. And I think that is also because I did, um, you know, I'm a Mitchell Trubisky fan. So watching him hit that double doink and tank that entire franchise um, with Trubisky, um, I think that it's just, it's a stain on his name. He also had a terrible debut for the Browns in the infamous 2016 season. So I understand fans not wanting to have him around because say, Hey, let's find a young kicker and let's, let's, let's search for the next Justin Tucker. Let's stop going with, you know, the retreads and guys who have been team, the team, the team by this point. Yeah. I mean, Justin Tucker, he saved the Ravens so many times in a late game situation. He's the most accurate kicker in NFL history. So think about how many times he's made a clutch kick and he's been so automatic throughout his career. And he did have some struggles this season, Pat, you brought up a great point earlier, but as we start to wrap up here on the Browns nation station, final thoughts from either of you, again, free agency, the negotiating period starts March 15th. It officially starts on March the 17th when a free agent can actually physically sign with the team, but any final thoughts before we sign off here? I'll go ahead and just say my only final thought is that the Browns, should make J.J. Watt their top priority because with all the guys coming back, including Odell Beckham, all over the roster, you look at, okay, we're taking Vernon out of the equation most likely. What's the best way to complement Miles Garrett, who's arguably one of the best players in all of football? Add someone like J.J. Watt for a year, try to win a Super Bowl, and that is the, that is the rebuilding team's way to win a Super Bowl, you do it before your quarterback's getting paid a ton of money. That's the way they do it. The Chiefs did it. I mean, they gave out a half a billion dollar contract, but most of it's not guaranteed. So the Browns should go all in, get someone like Watt. And if it doesn't work, maybe next year we're cutting Landry, getting rid of Becca, making all these changes. So I'm all in on Watt. And I think that should be not their only priority. That'd be silly, but the thing they're focusing most of their time on. I got two final thoughts. The first one is, um, you know, we, we alluded to it earlier. When is the last time the Cleveland Browns could talk about all these free agents and really expect those free agents to consider the Cleveland Browns? 
you know, the culture here has changed dramatically. People want to come to Cleveland. Uh, stars want to come to Cleveland. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just phenomenal. I'm so happy for the Cleveland Browns fans. Uh, the other question is, when is the last time we went into a free agent period or a draft and nobody is discussing which quarterback we should pick up? Yeah. You know, last year, we needed, even with Mayfield in place last year, we were discussing, well, do we get a, a good enough backup to challenge him as a starter? Do we get somebody to mentor him? You know, and when we got Keenan, we still weren't sure what we had. Was he there to challenge him for the starting role or was he there to mentor him? Uh, you know, wound up as a mentor. And, um, but now we got, you know, Mayfield, what, two years in a row playing all 16 games plus a couple of playoff games. We've got a solid backup in Keenum. And uh, I mean, they'll probably sign somebody for training camp, you know, later, but, um, but yeah, it's just very exciting. We're not worried about, you know, all these quarterbacks in the draft and uh, Cleveland, sorry, not interested this year. And again, good for us. You know, Mark, one point I want to make really quick um, before your final thoughts is I want to say, I was thinking based on what Pat just said, if you had to write a book about the Browns over the past decade and their free agency, it'd basically be from Dwayne Bowe to JJ Watts, <laughs> because we're not signing the worst possible player. We're talking about the best possible player. And it's like, all these battle scars from the past can all be washed away thanks to a competent front office. Steven, I can't top that and I can't wash away all of the pain you had from the 2016 <laughs> season. But I will say I look forward to talking with each of you when the Browns sign J.J. Watt here in a month. And that's what odds makers predict. He is the favorite to go and sign with the Cleveland Browns this offseason. So we'll see if that's how it shakes out. But fellas, this is always so much fun to talk with both of you. I'll go ahead and sign off here. For Stephen Kibitza and Pat Opperman, I'm Mark Bergen. Thank you for listening to the Browns Nation Station. Please leave us a five-star review. We'll read that here on the show. If you leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your shows. Take care. So long, everyone. We'll see you next time.